and welcome to a Hana Kako, which means let's work together. We're a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. My name is Kili'i Akina, president of Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, and I'm just delighted to be able to host today a wonderful friend and a great leader here in Hawaii, Mufi Hanneman. We're going to be talking about building leaders in Hawaii. In fact, that's how Mufi and I got to know each other in a leadership program that he founded many years ago. We'll get to talk about that a bit, and he and I have together been building leaders in this great state. What is it to be a leader? Why is leadership important? You know, one great leader said this, everything rises and falls on leadership. In other words, if you have good leaders, you're going to have the system work out well. But if you have bad leaders, poor leaders, things won't go so well. And that's probably why my guest has invested himself so much in the building of leaders. But we're not just going to talk about building leaders. We're going to get into his mind and into his heart. Because uh, as we look at the making of a leader himself, Mufi Hanneman, we're going to gain some wonderful insights into the way things work here in Hawaii. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to all of you in the Think Tech Hawaii audience, my friend and former mayor of Honolulu, Mufi Hanneman. Mufi, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Kili. Great. Well, we say a hana kako. Let's work together. And uh, I'm glad you and I have been able to do that for many, many years. Absolutely. You've set a wonderful standard and a good uh, example to a lot of the uh, people that you've touched. So. Well, uh, I thank you, too, for your mentorship and your leadership of programs that I've been able to be part of and so forth. I've been inspired by them. And today, I not only want to talk about what building leaders in Hawaii is all about and the programs you're involved in but I want to get into your life a bit you know what what makes this leader uh, when you go back to your Hanabata days <laughs> what's the formative influence that has taken you to where you are today well there's no question it's my parents uh, yes I came from a home uh, where uh, my, my parents moved to Hawaii made a conscious decision to leave Samoa to go first to Guam then to Hawaii because they wanted to uh, expose their children to Western style education. They want to give us as many opportunities as possible in this uh, uh, land of dreams, if you will. Well, you know, that's very, very far sighted to, to, to come from Samoa and to have a very open heart about wanting to expose children to Western values. Because I isn't there a lot of conflict today sometimes people talk about between Pacific values and Western values? How, how did your family reconcile that in your own? Uh, well, that's why Hawaii is such a great place mm -hmm. uh, to be if, if you have. Uh, Pacific Islander background or you have a minority status, if you will, is because we allow people uh, to live as they mm -hmm. wish, to practice their culture, to preserve it, perpetuate it, and all of that is done under the rubric of being a good American citizen. So in many ways it's the best of both worlds for my family. Now, my father is also of German English, so yes, yes. I'm actually Samoan German English, having been born and raised uh, in Hawaii, born in Queens Hospital, grew up in Kalihi. So from very early on, it was uh, nurtured within us, this idea right. of getting as mm -hmm. much education as possible and then looking to contribute, looking to give back, looking to make the area, the place that you live, and the folks around you uh, try to uh, lift them, enrich them, and give back. Well, I know a lot of famous people were born in Queens Hospital, and I bet you have the birth certificate to prove it. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at the very least, being a Pacific Islander, could not be characterized as a disadvantage in your case, but something your parents embraced as part of the making of you as a leader. Well, clearly, I had no means of escaping it because mm -hmm. my name reflects uh, my ethnic ancestry. Uh, my, my given uh, first name is Muli Ufi. Muli Ufi, and what does that mean? Well, the literal translation doesn't mean much. It really is the bottom of, a, of the yam. Okay. Okay, but I'm named after my great-grandfather. Mm -hmm. who was one of the original signatories of the deed of session that ceded Eastern Samoa to the United States of America. Interesting. And Francis is from my English mm -hmm. background, and Hahnemann is my German name. So uh, growing up as a Pacific Islander gave me a sense of identity, and I remember bemoaning the fact when I was young, I was telling my mom, why did you give me a name like Muliufi? It always gets mispronounced in school. You know, why couldn't you give me a name like John, Bill, <laughs> Tom? And she, my mom was telling me, you're named after your great-grandfather and one day you'll be very proud of that. Mm. So it wasn't until I was a freshman at Harvard, I'm in the bowels of Widener Library looking up everything I could about Polynesian history, and lo and behold, my eyes were fixated on a copy of the Treaty of the Deed of Session. Interesting. And there was my great-grandfather, Muliufi Pinimoa Soliai, one of the chiefs that had the foresight and the wisdom uh, to have this union with the United States that 
led to uh, where we were, uh, where we uh, actually moved to Hawaii and took advantage of being American citizens. It seems then that your namesake is somewhat, uh, well, foretelling of, of the role you'd play in, in this land, in Hawaii, a land that came from Pacific and transitioned into part of the United States. Well, I've always felt that mm -hmm. the Pacific region is a very special place, mm -hmm. and Hawaii plays a very critical role uh, in going forward, certainly the history of bringing the entities of the island nations together. And I really believe in many ways, uh, when we talk about the Pacific Asian region, it's not just China, Japan, Korea, That's uh, right. Taiwan, you know, as important as those entities are, we also uh, have to take into account the Pacific Island mm. roots that we have. That's why what I know what Thompson and others have done with yes. Korea is very, very important because it brings it full circle and makes us understand the indigenous host people's role in all of this, the Native Hawaiian culture, but also the partnership that we have with all the other Pacific Islands. Right. Now, going back to your mother, you said that you ended up at Harvard. Didn't she play a significant role in setting that goal and bringing it about? Yeah, she was very adamant uh, mm -hmm. that uh, I pursue her American dream, and that was to go to Harvard because that's where President Kennedy and President Roosevelt went to school. So she felt when we came here that uh, it was incumbent upon someone uh, to be able to do that. So I was blessed with a lot of encouragement, mm -hmm. a lot of nurturing, a very supportive uh, family, a set of siblings uh, that helped me, and then wonderful educators, wonderful teachers from Kalikai, Puhali and Fern Elementary School yes. and uh, helped me get there. Mm. You know, that's an amazing story about your mother's sense of vision, her sense of history, and wanting to have a, a son or, or a child who, who would really rise to the highest levels. And her dream then was to get you to the finest education, Harvard. That, that is truly the American dream in many ways. Well, and that's one of the reasons why mom and dad wanted to move here was to expose us to mm -hmm. the highest levels of education. So. Uh, I remember as a youngster, we would walk from our home on Camp Fourth Road. Uh, today, you have to say Kamehameha Fourth That's Road. right. <laughs> uh, and, and, and make that journey to the Kali Palama mm -hmm. Library. Uh, and she would make sure that I'd spend as much time on that as I did on the ball fields or the basketball courts because she really felt that it was important for me to develop a good habit about wanting to learn and mm. wanted to pursue education. You know, Mufi, going back to what shaped you into a leader, I recall that one of the first times I ever met you took place, and, and uh, I didn't tell you I'd talk about this today, at IEA High School. Uh, you and I were the guest speakers at a student leadership conference there at IEA High School. And I remember I was mesmerized by the story that you told. I was representing the Center for Tomorrow's Leaders. You were Mufi Hanneman. And uh, you told the story of your uncle or your cousin, another Hanneman. It was a Nephi Hanneman who was doing a knife dance and uh, uh, had an accident but went on and endured. And you talked about uh, leadership as being something that you just keep doing against all odds. That's the one thing I remember. And the other thing that I remember is you said it's about people. It's about relationships. Now, do you recall that back at IA High School? I, I've gone to IA many times. And <laughs> I, I vaguely remember that particular speech because I try to weave in all kinds of examples, whatever is top of mind. But certainly my, my family has had a, a great um, influence on me. My father was an educator, if you will. Uh, uh, he graduated at the age of 14. And back then, incredible. It was incredible, <laughs> yes. And, uh, he was an educator mm -hmm. in Samoa before they moved here, and um, certainly his influence and the importance of education has always been paramount in my life. But I think the main thing about being a leader is recognizing that to be a good leader, you have to be a good follower. You know, leaders are just not born overnight, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly you have to acquire uh, good skills. You have to learn as much as possible how to be a good leader, and leading by example is very, very important. Uh, those who I think get the best results are those that are able to roll up their sleeves, get in the trenches, and practice what I call the Mahalo Principle. It's always thank people. Ah. No man is an island. No person can do it alone. You that's right. recognize that it takes a group of people coming together. And that's very important because that needs to sustain you in the good times as well as the bad times. But when you say the key to being a leader is being a good follower, you're talking about all the mentorship you had from your parents, from your teachers, from your professors, and others. Well, it's also recognizing <coughs> to Kali that you're mm -hmm. not going to always be the major leader or the top leader, if you will. I've always taken the view, as David Heenan wrote in his book, that everyone's a co-leader. That's everyone right. You feel part of it. And, you know, Lao Tzu said it best too many, many years ago. 
but at the end of the day, the people will have thought that they did it themselves. So I think if you empower people, you give them a sense of entitlement, you make them feel part of the process, uh, I think that's what leads to good results. And I think mm -hmm. recognizing that sometimes you're going to be leading the brigade, others you're going to be following and being part of the group and lending support. Uh, and, and certainly that's important to recognize. Well, I, I think that uh, the idea that you just expressed here, that leadership is not only about being up front, not only about being the one in the top position, it's also about partnership. It's also about co-leadership. You mentioned David Heenan's book, and uh, you may recall the, the event at which uh, I was able to acquire a signed copy of his book because you made that possible with the Pacific Century Fellows, his book entitled Part Great Partnerships or Partnerships. One of those partnerships was the relationship between Charles Reed Bishop and Bernice Pawahi Bishop. And uh, w with that, I I'm wondering if we can draw a, a, a little bit of your wonderful wife into this picture here. Uh, you and Gail seem to have a, a power leadership relationship. She's the head of a fairly important social organization here in Hawaii, and you have been mayor and other positions. How would you characterize your co-leadership with Gail? Well, I, I think it's more of a servant leadership mm -hmm. rather than a power leadership. She does a fantastic job as a CEO of the Girl Scouts, very dedicated. Yes, it's an uh, incredible to, organization to here. And, and developing uh, uh, our young women to their fullest potential. It's mm -hmm. amazing the number of young women who have benefited from a Girl Scout experience, similarly with the Boy Scouts. So uh, I think we try to be supportive in that regard, and I recognize that, uh, you know, she uh, sets a wonderful example out there. And, you know, to see her do very well with the Girl Scouts is very fulfilling, not just for myself, but I see the women that she's touched uh, throughout the year. Well, tell Gail, Patty, and I sent our aloha to her. Absolutely. You're listening to former Mayor Mufi Hanneman as we talk about building leaders in Hawaii. I'm Kaylee Akina, President of Grassroot Institute. We're on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, and we'll be right back after this. presentation of Think Tech Hawaii is made possible by Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates. Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho, the Senior Executive at BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle and Cook, Hawaii, for the time-honored legacy that stands more than 160 years and revolves around this nation's investment in Hawaii, creating communities and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the Gas Company, a component of the Liquefied Natural Gas Initiative, helping Hawaii achieve transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics a Hawaii-based tech company powering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data needed to better inform property and investment decisions. Welcome back to a Hana Kako, which means let's work together. We're a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kelihi Akina, president of Grassroot Institute. Leadership, that's something Hawaii needs more than ever before. And leadership is being offered from many quarters. But there are few who truly understand the process of building leaders, and more particularly, building leaders in Hawaii. Uh, my guest today, Mufi Hanneman, although he's had a career in the public limelight has done something behind the scenes for decades and that is mentor young men, men and women in business in government in the arts and in, in other arenas 
and many of them are cropping up today in positions of leadership and influence. Uh, in fact, we know each other because of our joint en endeavors in building leaders in Hawaii. Mufi, welcome back. Thank you. You know, uh, you started a program about 13, 17 years ago, isn't it? Pacific yes. Century Fellows, because of a leadership program you went through yourself. Tell us about that. Yes, I was very fortunate to be chosen as a White House Fellow. Yes, uh, under which president? Under then President Ronald Reagan. Yes. And I had the privilege opportunity as a White House Fellow to serve in the office of the Vice President of then uh, Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush. Just a little bit of a background on that. Uh, the White House Fellows is an, uh, program is an opportunity for young Americans to come to Washington and spend a year working uh, in government and also having an opportunity to participate in what's called an education program yes. where they get to meet with movers and shakers throughout the country, take trips, uh, and observe what's going on. And the whole idea is to nurture in you an idea of giving back so that when you return uh, to your particular profession or your state you're sitting from, uh, you will take back with you perhaps uh, ideas from that particular year, but also instill in you an ongoing feeling of giving back. And I guess the most uh, prominent male White House fellow has been uh, General Colin Powell. Yes, that's right. Uh, and uh, former Secretary mm -hmm. of Transportation uh, Elizabeth Dole could probably be considered you know, our most prominent female. It was started by President Johnson way back in the mid-60s, and I first heard about it when I was a student at Harvard taking an American presidency course from a woman named Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, who everyone yes. is, knows about. She's written biographies on Lyndon Johnson, Abraham Lincoln, and so forth. And I remember being so fascinated in her class with all the anecdotes that she had of working in the White House. And she admitted that she was able to get all of this because she was a White House fellow. So I always had in the back of my mind that maybe one day I'd be able to do that. And fortunately, I was chosen. So when I returned to Hawaii, you know, I said, you know, we need to do something similar. We may not be able to give a professional work experience like I had, but let's change the focus from our nation to the Pacific Asian arena, and let's have a very top-notch education program where once a month, the fellows would get together and meet on a topic that they would choose, as you know, uh, from their opening day retreat. Uh, so it could be on education, it could be on Hawaiian sovereignty, it could be on the economy, it could be on the military to be on small business. Mm -hmm. And so we've had 13 classes of fellows. We're in the process now of selecting our 14th class. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful program. We select people from all over the state. They're chosen by a Blue Ribbon Committee of Judges. Uh, we uh, always had a good representation from the military, because I believe, although they may come and go, the military is a major right. part of our, They've always been part our of Ohana program. here. Yes, so it's, uh, it's really been very fulfilling to see people have come in and have gone on and have done great things in our community. You know, as you're talking about how you were inspired to start the Pacific Century Fellows, you bring to mind a learning experience for you. That underscores what you said in the first segment, and that is in order to be a leader, one must be a follower. So you invested in your own life, your own development, by going into a program that would maximize your leadership, and then you gave after that. You, you came back to Hawaii and said, I want to get started. Now, I'm grateful for the opportunity that, w that was extended to me to be a Pacific Century Fellow, and, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the environment is unique. Uh, there are many mentoring programs in Hawaii, many fellows programs, and I'm glad for that. They're growing in number. Yes. But really, Pacific Century Fellows is the gold standard by, by all means. Well, we're, we would be very blessed because we've had people like yourself that have come in. It's one thing to have a program, but if you don't have people that want to be a fellow and want to go through the program and then be able to create what has really become a very important part of the fellows experience yes. is that every class sort of gets together and they keep it going beyond right. that particular year and then we've had opportunities to bring all of them together. And that's been fabulous. So this networking, the esprit de corps, the camaraderie has, has been invaluable. You know, just a few nights ago we were at the Bishop Museum inside of Hawaii Hall and it was just absolutely packed with fellows alumni and I don't know how many were there uh, it looked to me as though there were at least a couple hundred but how did you feel seeing that here was a cadre of 16 years of individuals who've gone through the program who are still together in, in some sense with a common vision and it was diverse there were Democrats there were Republicans there were independents there were business people there were teachers there were those in the arts how did you feel chicken skin goosebumps it was really uh, a very fulfilling 
uh, evening to be able to see everyone come together, everyone express appreciation going through the program, and then recognizing that there was so much more to do uh, and that they wanted to identify causes and things that they could work on together, you know, bringing sure, people absolutely. together. So I really believe that uh, in many ways we've just scratched the surface. Uh, with the work that I'm doing now that takes me to the Pacific, I'm getting ready to unveil the uh, Pacific Century Fellows uh, Saipan chapter. How about uh, that? They've, uh, they've seen what we've done here. Uh, they face many similar issues that we do in terms of being an insular area. Uh, brain drain, many of their best and brightest leave and so forth. So uh, they see what we did here and they talk to me and say, oh, that's great. So we want to take the program elsewhere in the Pacific region. We want to have interaction with leaders that come through the East-West sure. Center and so forth. One of the things I most appreciated about that experience is the fellowship coming together of people who otherwise would stay apart from each other. We, we, there were multiple political perspectives, religious perspectives, lifestyles represented, professions, and, and what you gain by becoming close to a group of people who are different from yourself is an appreciation for that sweet spot where we can agree together and where we can put aside the differences. It, is that a deliberate effort in, in, in your well, structuring of the program? It's important that you see all points of views, and that's what we try to encourage. Right. So we don't have any one person or any one entity dominate uh, the experience or the sessions that the fellows go through, because we really want them to see both sides and then be able to ascertain for themselves what is it that they believe in, what is it that they want to pursue, and why that particular viewpoint maybe should be something that should be spread throughout uh, the community. So I think that's very important. The fact that we have kept it uh, non-political, that we have uh, reached out to all aspects of the community and no one person selects the fellows as you know it's a panel That's of judges right. uh -huh. who have a proven track record in the community for leadership you know has really been right. very good and i've appreciated the fact that you have always looked for leaders regardless of their ideology regardless of their partisanship and so forth i remember when i uh, went up for my interview it was with someone against whom I had testified in a hearing just the year before and it was it was a very strong testimonial <laughs> and, and uh, she did not look very happy at the at that experience but when she interviewed me she was totally fair and then later on you announced every fellow who had been selected had been selected by unanimous vote and I just I just was so grateful at that moment when I realized here were leaders who were looking for the greater good of Hawaii they weren't looking for who will promote my ideology. You see, and I think that's the essence of being a good leader, is to go beyond a personal conflict or uh, an issue that you may disagree with someone. You know, I've always said when I was in public office, don't judge me by one issue. Look at the totality of everything that we've tried to do and then make your, your, your decision. Right. And I think in this day and age, there's no excuse for a leader, whether he is in the public or private sector, to get back to your organization, to your co-workers, on why a decision was made. Uh, I think it's incumbent to do that. They may not always agree with you, but I think if you can explain the process by which you went through to arrive at that decision, it's, uh, it goes down a lot better. Yes. Well, I want to thank you for the inspiration you provided. Uh, the year after I graduated with my class from the Center for Tomorrow's Leaders, I started a program, excuse me, from the Pacific Century Fellows. I started a program for top-level high school students, some of the most talented young people, called the Center for Tomorrow's Leaders. Patty and I founded that program and retained many of the same elements, meeting with movers and shakers, the fellowship opportunity, uh, the opportunity to learn about leadership and so forth. And um, one of the things that I learned in the process is setting a high bar is absolutely essential for inspiring people to become their best. It's so often here in Hawaii, and this is not a criticism of who we are, but a side effect of the unity that we have, the harmony we have, is it's sometimes not easy for people with talent and ability and drive to stand out. You know how it's often said, the nail that stands up is the one that gets knocked down. So, so young people often don't have the challenge and the encouragement, but one thing that makes that happen or brings that out is when they're around the top student from another high school, the top student from uh, a home school, the top student from a private school. It creates a new kind of fellowship. How, how has that 
been an important part of the Pacific Century Fellows. I, I know it's, it's difficult to get in. Many people uh, go through the process and aren't accepted. It's a disappointment. You can't buy your way in. You have to compete for it. What's the value of that? Well, I, you know, I tell people, look at me, and, and uh, as an example, my political career, I've won some, I've lost some. <laughs> uh, but if in your heart and soul you believe that that's what you want to do, you shouldn't stop trying. So we've had people that have tried once, twice, three times before they, got, they get selected as a fellow. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, but I think what you were talking about gives rise to a thought that I think is very important that I try to impart to the fellows as part of my leadership maxims that I've put together based on my experience through the years, and that is never base decisions on fear. Hmm. Too many times I've seen golden opportunities wasted or missed because someone's afraid to dare to be different, to dare to stand up and try to do what he or she feel is right. And I think that's very important uh, to keep that in Absolutely. mind. Absolutely. Um, in, in a field that I'm very familiar with in, in politics, for example, many leaders base their decisions on polls or what the letters to the editors are saying uh, and so forth or, the, or what the social media blogs are saying. And they feel, I feel, to really pick up uh, where what should be done, and, and sometimes they're in the best position to make a difference and move things forward. So I think that's very, very important to keep in mind that, you know, leadership, or good leadership entails risks. And sometimes you can't always play it safe if it's the right thing to do, because sometimes you can get lulled into doing things that are popular as opposed to what is right. I think what you're saying is, is that leadership requires courage courage to stand up for what is right even though it may not be popular and I'm sure that in your own life you've had many many episodes in which you had to do that can you think of one now in particular or you know I actually am thinking of one that I'd like to hear what you think about uh, or how you reflect on it do you remember when uh, the sewage system on the <laughs> for, uh, near the Alawai was about to burst and overflow and it could potentially send sewage all throughout Waikiki you made a very difficult decision, uh, and that was to release the sewage into the Alawai. Any reflections on that? Well, I, I think the first thing is be careful for what you ask for, you just may get it. Because <laughs> when I was trying to be mayor, I remember reflecting on my concern about our infrastructure. That's right. That we hadn't paid enough attention to it, and that my biggest fear was a possible sewage spill in Waikiki. And I remember saying that during the course of that campaign, and people were going, what is he talking about? You know, there's never going to be a sewage spill. Oh, he's just doing that to get a headline. He's just doing that to be different, if you will. But being on the inside, the years on the city council, I knew that money set aside for those type of improvements were not being spent on that. And knowing what was uh, happening in the two square miles that we call Waikiki right. and, the, and the, uh, the enormous amount of investment and economics uh, benefit that comes from that area, you know, something like that could be catastrophic. So lo and behold, in my second year in office, 42 straight days of nonstop rain exacerbated what was already a deteriorating uh, infrastructure problem with our wastewater system there. And we had, uh, you know, a massive uh, spill. And well, be before you go on, just, uh, just bring us into the drama a little more. At some point, your city engineers or the people in the know had to give you the facts and tell you what your options were. Uh, how much time passed between that and your making that tough decision to release the, the, the uh, sewage? Well, into the well first of all, uh, you know, my non-engineer background mm -hmm. was saying, find it, find the leak, plug it, plug it, <laughs> okay, and, 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 and then let's... <laughs> <laughs> Every administration before you. For exactly. Six, six and, and, and my feeling was, you know, let's hope that the rain will subside mm -hmm. and we can really get there and, and, and do a good Band-Aid job uh, and, and not have to face that, that situation of spilling uh, sewage into the Alawai. Well, when I sat with my engineers, I had a very good crew of engineers, and they basically said, well, here are your options. We can try to do that, Mr. Mayor, but there's no guarantee we can get to it. Uh, and the problem may be even worse. I said, how so? They said, well, if we can't get to it and the sewage continues to overflow, uh, we'll have the sewage running over into the streets, hotels, condo units, restaurants, what have you. I said, okay, give me, uh, give me some time to think about it. Uh, I basically took you know, a two-minute walk to my right, <laughs> turned around, came back, and said, you know what, dump it into the LOI. Uh, do it you know, as quickly as possible and don't tell me till you're done with it. 
what's going on. How about that? Yeah. Now, we have a left angel and a right angel sitting on our shoulder, and one of them is whispering in your ear, you're going to be known as the mayor who flooded the Alawai with sewage and destroyed Hawaii's visitor economy. <laughs> Absolutely, and that's exactly what many had said uh, when I made that decision. But it was the right decision. It was one that uh, I was sort of preparing myself for, because if you may remember, right. after a scant 1,300 margin of victory in an election in 2004, I came into office, and one of the first things I did was I raised the sewer fees. There you go. And uh, I said it was in anticipation of the work that we had not done. But my pledge was whatever monies were deposited into the sewer fund will only be spent for sewer and wastewater that it wouldn't be rated as has been done in the past to go into the general fund. So, you know, I was sort of preparing myself for this. I didn't realize we we're going to have this kind of major catastrophe. But that being said, and we all put our shoulders to the wheel. We were very dedicated. We also had a decades old lawsuit hovering over us by the EPA. So we had that at one end. We had problems with our Santa Island treatment plant. All of that sort of enabled us to kind of come together. And it took major leadership, major support. And it was a wonderful opportunity to take a crisis and turn it into an opportunity to make things better. There you Net go. result, now fast forward, right. is that no future mayor and no future city council will have to suffer uh, what we had to go through because we basically made sure that we took the steps necessary, provided the leadership uh, so that these kind of things won't happen again. What I appreciate about this is it really fleshes out what you say about the need for courage, about leadership requiring someone to have the fortitude with which to do the right thing at the right time regardless of what anyone else may say or regardless of whatever criticism well, may ensue as a result of that. And I appreciate that because, you know, today as, as we think about some of the problems Hawaii is facing, and the need to pay down our unfunded liabilities, the, the need to uh, improve the cash flow both in government and in the, in the state for consumers throughout and businesses, at some point or another, there may be some very hard measures, some difficult measures that may not seem correct politically. We have to bite the bullet. We may have to pay higher taxes. I'm not promising that on your behalf because you may still have a political career. But, but <laughs> I think what you demonstrated in, in that action of doing the unpopular thing for the greater good is the kind of courage leadership requires. I think the other thought that comes to mind and I've used repeatedly is the longer you delay, the more you're going to pay. So if you're not taking care of the basics, if you're not taking care of the infrastructure and not tackling problems now and just kicking the can down the road and somebody's going to pay for it. That's right. And so you may get hit, you may get criticized, but again, if it's the right thing to do, you need to do it. Good. Well, you've been listening to Mufi Hanneman, former mayor of Honolulu, talking about courageous leadership. And when we come back to a Hanakako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, we'll continue looking at what it takes to be a leader in Hawaii. We'll be right back after this. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. I want to tell you about our program this month. We're doing a luncheon panel program at the Plaza Club with the Hawaii Venture Capital Association and Think Tech about China. It's Don't Be Afraid to Send Your Kid or CEO to China. Stories of daring do and of life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness in the People's Republic. We want to introduce you to some people who have lived in China and show you that life in China is not so bad. It's not all about corruption and environmental degradation and lack of civil or human rights. It's not like that. And we want to have them tell you their day-to-day -day stories about how they've lived there. So our moderator is Larry Foster. He has taught uh, law in China, and he has taught, been practicing law in China for a firm in, uh, in Shanghai. His wife, Brenda Foster, is on the panel. Uh, she has been the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai. We have Russell Liu. He's an attorney practicing with Shepard Mullen uh, in Beijing for quite some time. Shackley Ruffetto, a circuit court judge from Maui, who, uh, after retiring, went to China so he could teach judicial process there. And uh, Nikki Shishido, who has worked for DBED, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism of the State of Hawaii uh, in Beijing for some time. All these people have had the experience of living on the ground in China. We want to have them tell their stories to you. So maybe this will encourage you to send your kid or CEO to China. So if you're interested in this program, which ought to be very interesting, come down on August 22nd. You can sign up at hvca.org. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo. We'll see you there. 
Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network talking with movers and shakers and learning a bit more about what makes Hawaii work. Uh, today my guest Mufi Hanneman is talking about building leaders for Hawaii. Uh, there are few individuals who have so intently focused on being a leader and building others as leaders. Many of you know of his program, the Pacific Century Fellows, an offshoot of the White House Fellows. Uh, right now, what we're going to talk a bit about is something that goes to the heart of Hawaii being a unique environment. Uh, oftentimes, people come to Hawaii and practice a certain style of leadership. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. But for those of us who have grown up, lived in, worked in Hawaii, we know that there are some uniquenesses about living and about being a leader and leading large numbers of people. Few people know this as well as my guest, Mufi Hanneman, Mayor of Honolulu. Well, Mufi, isn't that right? Hawaii is a very special place when it comes to bringing people together and practicing leadership. Absolutely. You know, we pride ourselves on the spirit of Aloha, which basically uh, is a process and, a, and, a, and a, a lifestyle that encourages people to exude warmth, compassion, make everyone feel important, don't leave anyone out. Uh, and whether you've lived here for one year or you've lived here all your life, everyone is welcome here. Well, you know, Mufi, is aloha really unique? I mean, everywhere across the world, there's some form of love, some form of benevolence, and so forth. Uh, or even if we talk in very Western, stark Western negotiation terms, there's win-win. But, but what is it that makes aloha unique? Those of us who like to think that it is here in Hawaii. Well, I think you're correct. I think everyone has their style of aloha. But aloha is so synonymous with Hawaii. Their songs, mm -hmm. their books. There are stories uh, that um, basically emphasize a concept of aloha uh, in motion that people can actually see, people can actually feel and experience. So uh, the fact that it's also it also means many things, aloha. That also it, it, it takes on a, a much broader uh, meaning than than just saying aloha. Uh, and I really find that with Hawaii, to practice leadership here, I think you have to really embrace the indigenous host culture. I don't think you can be successful as a leader here, uh, no matter what your vocation may be, unless you really understand how this place was inhabited and why uh, the Native Hawaiian culture is so embedded to everything that we do. So I think that's very, very important. Uh, concepts of uh, uh, doing things local style. Absolutely. Concepts mm -hmm. of doing things that are pono uh, are very, very important. and. Everyone that I've seen, I've witnessed that has done that, by and large, may not always get their way, but at least they are understood a lot better than those that come in and sometimes practice a different style or method that we haven't seen or not used to or not consistent with the local way of doing things. Certainly. And, and as we practice aloha, as we practice the kind of sensitive leadership style, sensitive to the culture, sensitive to the history and so forth, what are some of the political, and I don't mean partisan by this, but some of the political realities we have to deal with and, and navigate that are, that are unique here? I mean, it, it, someone might think, well, here's blue state versus red state, and, and that's the whole story. But, but it's a far more complex story navigating uh, people and politics and culture here. Well, I, I think maybe the most graphic example of understanding differences, if you will, is recognizing that there's a Wahoo and there's a neighborhood. Okay, so that's an important. So oftentimes, good ideas or good programs in Oahu don't really get any kind of momentum on the neighbor islands because it's seen as too Honolulu centric, too Oahu centric. It doesn't encompass enough of the neighbor island input and participation. And then conversely, it can also be the same. Things that are done on the neighbor islands sometimes don't get embraced. Um, too readily on Oahu because it'd say, well, you know what, it's, you know, those islands are small and they don't experience the fact that we are the, Honolulu is the 13th largest city in the United States. So I think if you're able to meld the two and make it uh, that whatever it is that you're trying to promulgate or advocate, that whatever is good for Oahu is good for the neighbor islands, whatever is good for the neighbor islands is good for Oahu. Um, I can give you a good example. Before it was thought that if you wanted to see good local entertainment, uh, if you want to see, uh, you know, musical stars or a good movie uh, from the mainland, you have to come to Oahu. That's no longer the case. Right. That's right. I mean, this is 
recently uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire that has a, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of fans. For, you know, there was a concert on Oahu, there was a concert on Maui. And I think that that's an example of what we need to do more of, is just not have things always on Oahu or things are always on the neighbor islands, but yet recognize that when those things happen, that everybody should feel a part sure. of it. That's why the Pacific Century Fellows Program has insisted from the beginning that it wasn't just going to be an Oahu organization. Every year we reach out to the neighbor islanders and we've been very fortunate to have fellows from Maui, Molokai, Lanai, um, Kauai, uh, and, and the big islands. Very, very important. I think that's one of the things that you have to understand if you're a leader here uh, and you're trying to do something and maybe say it's based on uh, in Honolulu, you got to understand that make sure people uh, realize that the neighbor islands can benefit from it. The other thing too is the ongoing discussion of an agricultural lifestyle, keeping the country country and urbanization and urban development if you will and recognizing that you know sometimes uh, when you do things like that is people have to understand that if, it, if there's going to be something that's done in, in, in a, an area that has been designated for growth and development, that's to help keep the country country, to keep urban encroachment from going there. That's why it's very important to also make sure that we have a future in agriculture, that we can always be development, because we have to keep Hawaii green. Mm -hmm. and, and now when we talk yes. about sustainability, we talk about what can, initiatives that can keep us environmentally friendly, that's right. or growing mm -hmm. more of our own as opposed to always importing. Those things are all very, very important, so it's that balance. So with, with all of these issues, regardless of whether we're talking about the mix between agriculture and urbanization, or, or energy and environmental protection and so forth, you, you're talking about the fact that we have to recognize all the stakeholders and, and look for the common good. How can we serve both neighbor islands and Oahu, and, and what is the best answer? Now, what kind of advice would you give? to up-and-coming political leaders, people who may want to serve in the public arena, as you have, who want to capture the hearts and minds of the public and, and to do good, maybe poising themselves for 2014. What are some values and strategies that they should perhaps keep in mind? Well, I think what's important uh, to recognize and, and appreciate is that it all starts with the community. Mm -hmm. And even if you have a great idea, if you don't have community buy-in, if you don't provide a process by which the community can have a say, then you're going to have some difficulty and some challenges down the line. So I've always said to leaders, whether they you know, hold executive positions or legislative positions, you can't beat having discussions. You can't beat having town hall meetings. You can't beat taking your idea out there. And even if it gets tossed aside or even if there's a lot of criticism, that's okay because it'll help you refine your argument. It'll help you make it a better uh, initiative going forward. So that's the first thing that I would say to them is, uh, you know, don't hold all your ideas and stuff or don't think that, you know, it's important that you keep your ideas away from a lot of scrutiny uh, or transparency uh, because sooner or later, at some point along, especially if it needs a government approval, you're going to have to go through that. So the sooner you do that, the better off you're going to be. You know, it's like, you don't just step on the field if you're a rookie right. and all of a sudden <laughs> very few people can do that. You need preseason training. Sometimes you need a season or two under your belt before you become a seasoned veteran and be able to take the reins and going forward. Well, you, you know, as everyone who's been in public service knows, that once you're in office, uh, there's no lack of people telling you what they think about your ideas. And, well, so, and so the sooner <laughs> exactly. that one gets into that process, yeah. the better. Yeah, and, and as I said earlier, too, I didn't know anything I would say to them is that you know, it's not a popularity contest. Yes, unfortunately, it comes down to the number of people who vote for you. There has to be the majority. But I really believe that, you know, there's, there's a place for people that espouse good ideas that are risky, that take courage. And somebody's got to get out there and push it and get it Absolutely. out in front for a public discussion. I think the last thing I would say is the aspect of uh, credit. I've seen situations where good ideas will fail because there's too much bickering over who's going to get the credit. There you go. And, you know, Quincy Jones said it best when they composed We Are the World. And That's he right. brought together all these superstars of singers from Springsteen to Stevie Wonder to Michael Jackson. What did he tell all of them? Check your ego at the door. Uh, and then if you're able to do that, then come in and let's do this great song. And I think that's the same thing. Too. At the end of the day, it's not about who gets the credit. If it's going to benefit the people, 
it's going to benefit your community and forget about the credit just do it on the other, on the flip side of credit whenever we're in the public eye as leaders we face criticism much of it is unfair sometimes they're right on the money and and you've had your share of criticism <laughs> <laughs> I was seven one you. before you know <laughs> I'm six seven I never had gray hair too before <laughs> if you would like to, to if you could tell our audience about the real movie something that they might not know from just watching the media just watching what the, the press says about you what your opponents say about you what's something about the real movie you could tell us today uh, and uh, I get to see you off record all the time but <laughs> you know I um, and by the way I will tell everybody uh, movie is as tall as he looks I'm <laughs> sitting on the telephone book right now <laughs> you know I, I suppose at the end of the day I've had choices to live elsewhere I've had choices to pursue careers that uh, were financial gain financial reward was uh, the number one objective uh, and I've said no. Uh, I've chosen the career that I have, which has primarily been public service, which has pr primarily been community service, uh, with little uh, involvement or time spent in the private sector, although I really believe that the time that I've spent and the time I'm spending now helps me become a well-rounded person. That at the end of the day, I'm all about making this place a better place to live, work, and play. Whether you agree with me or not, whether it's on the sewers or whether on rail or anything that I've tried to push and promulgate, uh, I've given it a lot of thought. I've always been open to discussion. I've been criticized a lot. And I understand that. I appreciate that. I think that's what makes our society what it is. That's why we have a democracy and not a dictatorship. Very good. Well, well thank you very much. I, I once heard Wufi share how, uh, for a Harvard business graduate, the direction of his income has been going the opposite direction of his fellow <laughs> classmates. <laughs> this is Kaylee Aquino with Mufi Hanneman. This is a Hanakako of the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We will be right back for our final segment after this. Come back. We want to thank our underwriters. Hawaiian Electric Company and its affiliates Maui Electric on Maui and Hawaii Electric Light Company on Hawaii Island are deeply committed to the communities they serve. Galen Ho is a senior executive of BAE Systems, a global defense, security, and aerospace company. The High Tech Development Corporation, the state's leading technology agency, attached to the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism. Castle in Cook, Hawaii, with a time-honored legacy that spans more than 160 years and revolves around its mission of investing in Hawaii, creating communities, and providing for the needs of our state. Hawaii Gas, formerly the gas company, a proponent of the liquefied natural gas initiative, helping Hawaii achieve its transition to clean energy and a better energy future. Collateral Analytics, a Hawaii-based tech company empowering the real estate industry with greater and faster access to the tools and data they need to make better informed property investment decisions. I'm Nicole Horry. Thanks so much for joining us on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. See you next time. Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of Grassroot Institute. I want to say mahalo to Jay Fidel and the folks at ThinkTech Hawaii. You're doing a great job of broadcasting content across the world that is really capable of changing lives, hearts, and minds. Uh, our guest today, Mufi Hanneman, is sharing his insights on building leaders in Hawaii. And now we return to our final segment for the next few minutes. Mufi, just enjoyed talking to you so much today. Well, before we conclude, I also want to say kudos to Jay Fidel. Hey, I've yes. known him for a long time. Jay can tell you we've not always been on the same side of an issue, but it's always been a civil discourse and a healthy respect and a relationship. Respectful relationship. Well, we are the Jay Fidel fan club. That's right. You're the man, Jay. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. <laughs> you know, um, leadership requires courage, as you pointed out, and you in your own life have taken courageous steps. As we look at the political scene now today and our need for good leaders, what are some issues that a good leader might rally around, might take a good stand on? What are some of the greater needs for Hawaii right now? Well, let me first talk about yes. my, I mentioned my long-standing passion ever since I really delved into this issue at Atlanta as a Harvard undergraduate and as a Fulbright scholar in New Zealand, and that's this whole aspect of the Pacific Asian Basin okay. and Hawaii's role and manifest destiny, if you will, in this Pacific Asian arena. 
more than ever the eyes of the world are upon Asia Pacific. And I really believe that we could use some brilliant, creative, energetic leadership to move us forward. Tourism is great for us, and I love tourism. I come from the tourism industry. But too often people see us just for sun, sand, sea, and surf, and spirit of aloha. There's a whole lot more under that, beneath that. And I really believe that uh, if we have more people thinking globally and taking advantage of our multicultural population, the assets that we bring to the table, uh, perhaps uh, we'll be able to nudge ourselves forward and be at the forefront of American policy and economic initiatives in this part of the world, or act as a conduit the other way sure. around, coming from Asia to, to the U.S. The other issue that I really believe needs a lot more focus and attention is our dependence on fossil fuels. Um, you know, everyone who looks at us from a distance, you know, they say, wow, what a beautiful place that you have. You're blessed with beautiful things that Akua uh, has seen fit to have in Hawaii, the sun, the wind, the ocean, and so forth. I think it's incumbent that we, we make major strides mm -hmm in the next, uh, in the upcoming years uh, in this area here. Uh, it, it, it's important, I think, for the, our long-term uh, view and perspective of how we care for the aina and the water that we drink and the like, but more importantly, what's gonna fuel this economy and the economic initiatives going forward. There are a lot of good ideas out there. Every governor that's been in office always talked about reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. Sure. But the fact of the matter is we haven't moved the needle that much. We're still 90% plus. So I think that needs to be done in a major way. The other area I think is our economy. Uh, certainly uh, people talk about diversifying our economy. I've always said our core competence is tourism. So rather than try to diversify away from it, strengthen it from within. You know, health tourism, uh, te technology tourism, uh, ecotourism. Uh, all those things to me have a very great uh, opportunity to build upon the fact that Hawaii is a great place to vacation, but also to do business, to learn, and to invest. And then, of course, I won't go into any detail on that because I've spoken about it so many times in the past, but we have to do something about the major traffic gridlock oh, that we have here. So transportation solutions are imperative uh, for us to move forward, and I've offered my set of views. Others have offered theirs, but we've got to do something because the status quo sure. is unacceptable. Now, all of these issues you've mentioned are, are extremely important for us to solve. That whether we're dealing with energy, whether we're dealing with international relations, whether we're dealing with transportation, and so forth. And, and yet, <clears throat> no one issue can be solved by itself. No. I mean, these issues exist in a political climate. And what do you see as, as the hope for making some shifts, some progress in the ability of the political climate to, to create positive solutions, to get people working on the same page, and so forth. Do you feel we're in a transitional time where, where we can actually begin to see some changes? Well, I'd like to see leadership be willing to take risk. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we are risk adverse, and we don't want to do things to rock the boat, or we believe we'll pay a price, either at the polls, or in business, or in winning consensus among people. So one of those risks is whether one will retain a, a position, whether one will retain funding in campaigns, uh, and that can be a disincentive to being courageous. Well, and, and that's exactly what the problem is. I think that we need more people willing to stand up for what they believe is right uh, and be able to do that in such a way. And a lot of times these ideas take time. Uh, you've got to say it once, you've got to say it twice, and then sometimes it's not the, the message is great, but it's the messenger. Then somebody else has to come in and pick it up and move it forward. And I think that's very important. And the last thing is that we keep talking about this time and time again is that people have to want to get involved. They have to step out of the comforts of their household or they have to get beyond the fact which we all go through, boy, the cost of living is so high. I don't have time to get involved. Whether it's the schools, whether it's in your community, your churches, your civic groups, your organizations, you know, we, we need quality participation. Not everyone is cut out to go to run for office, as you know. It's very difficult, the things that you have to do and do that. But at the end of the day, it takes a group of people wanting to improve their community, both from those who are in office, those who are out of office, those who are in the public sector, private sector, business, labor, academia, the military, whatever, all coming together and saying, 
Hawaii is no Kauai, and we want to make it no Kauai going into the future. Well, Mufi, I've really enjoyed talking with you, and I know that our listeners and viewers on Think Tech Hawaii have also enjoyed this. Uh, I appreciate it very much, and uh, want to thank you for being on board today. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, keep up the good work. Well, very good. My guest today, Mufi Hanneman, has helped us to understand some of the complexities of leadership here in Hawaii. Uh, not only has he been well-groomed, thanks to his parents and mentors and teachers, to enter the public sphere as a leader, uh, he's developed himself and has invested his life in building leaders around him. Uh, there are literally thousands of individuals who have benefited, and hundreds of them through the Pacific Century Fellows Program, including myself. And, and we come from diverse backgrounds, but the thing that we have in common is we're radically committed to being good leaders for Hawaii. And uh, based on that, I just want to encourage you to take up Mufi's challenge, to get involved, whether it is as a voter or a community member, a parent, uh, or even perhaps a future political candidate. Get involved and help make a difference. Uh, this has been the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Again, thanks to Jay Fidel and the entire team. Our program is called Ehana Kako. Let's work together. At the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, we say, we want to unite Hawaii's people for a better economy, government, and society. And I want to thank you for listening. I'm Kili Akina, President of Grassroot Institute. And please join me in a big mahalo to my guest today, Mufi Hanneman. Aloha. Aloha, Mufi. You did a great job. Thank, thank you. you. We'll say goodbye to the people out there. Yes. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. Mahalo.